Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. The theme and practice of sustainability has no borders. Even so, we understand that talking about sustainability in the Latin American context is of special importance. Climate and social issues are increasingly relevant and present. At the same time, what happens to organizations in the productive sectors intensifies problems and solutions. Thus, it is expected that this event will discuss sustainability issues at the most different levels and scope. We take this opportunity to remind you that this event is taking place over 30 years since a landmark in sustainability concerns in the world, the Rio 92 Summit. Coincidentally, in the same Latin America. Therefore, it seems to us that we do have a vocation and a commitment to study and propose alternatives to some of the great world problems. And in the same way as in this symposium, through partnerships with organizations from the most different regions and branches of activity. At the same time, we cannot forget about the Sustainable Development Agenda and the SDGs and the new trend of associating this with ESG. It seems to be clear that the search for solutions is no longer the objective of just a few to become a global objective. The symposium is being jointly organized by the Pontificia Universidade Católica do Paraná in Brazil, the Hamburg University of Applied Sciences in Germany, the Inter-University Sustainable Development Research Program, Universidad Pontificia Bolivariana, Universidad de Colima, Universidad del Estudio de Ferrara, in cooperation with various government offices and authorities, universities, enterprises, NGOs, and grassroots organizations from around the world. Sustainability researchers from across the world are warmly welcomed to present their work at the symposium. Their active inputs will help to reiterate the potential of sustainability science and research in Latin America, showing how it may contribute to the realization of the goals of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. We register and appreciate the attendance in person and online of the following participants. Dr. Fernanda Frankenberger, the chair of the Scientific Committee for Positivo University. Ubiratã Tortato, chair of Scientific Committee from Pontificia Universidade Católica do Paraná. Dr. Walter Leal, chair of Scientific Committee from Hamburg University of Applied Sciences in Germany. Dr. Bruno Henrique Rocha Fernandes, the dean of business school at PUC. Mr. Rodolfo Zanin Feijó, head of foreign affairs at City of Curitiba. Dr. Paula Cristina Trevilato, pro-rector for research, graduate studies and innovation at PUC. Dr. Massimiliano Mazzanti, Università degli Studi di Ferrara in Italy. Dr. Rodrigo Lozano, University of Gavel in Sweden. Ana Elena Builes Velez, Università Pontificia Bolivariana di Colombia. Dr. Carlos Lopez Preciado, Università de Colima, Mexico. Dr. Angela Povoa, Head of Business Graduate Program at PUC. Dr. Osiris Cancillieri, Jr., Head of Industrial and System Engineering Graduate Program at PUC Paraná. We also thank the presence of teachers, students, other authorities, and guests. Now, with the word, Dr. Ubirata Tortato, professor of the graduate program in business and of the graduate program in industrial and system engineering at PUC Paraná, and chair of the scientific committee on the first Latin American Symposium on Sustainability. Professor Tortato, please. Hello, and thank you for coming. I think that uh, in, in this moment, the only words that I have to say is thank you. And well, because I was working a lot and I ha do not have time to prepare my speech. Um, what we, I, I have to say more than this, that for us in this moment, it's uh, a, a, a significant landmark because after the pandemic, after COVID is the first meeting that you are hosting here, at least in, in our school, yeah? And for us, this moment is very important to join our supporters, like 
the city hall of Curitiba, and like the, the funding agents, agency in Brazil, CAPES, and all our international partners. For us, this is important because now we are living a new reality that we can connect people here in person and after people there online. Obviously that it was possible in the past, sure that. But now I think that we realize that this is not only possible, this is a trend. And in the future, maybe we work more with this. For us, it's very interesting because sustainability is a very important topic, not only in Brazil, sure, because sustainability now is, I think that it's most uh, comprehended around the world. As we can see in the, the spread of the three magical letters, yeah, E, S, and G. I think that in the last two years, more and more people, including in the business side, well, I'm in the business side, are talking more about this. And this, for us, it's a very important opportunity to put together people from business, from engineering, from social science, from other aspects, to stay together in this moment, doesn't matter if presentially or online, to discuss this. Then, to finish again, you are, are warmly welcome. I hope that you enjoy, sorry about the weather, yeah? But I think that, well, you have good times here. Um, uh, outside, uh, the city hall provide you uh, uh, touristic information and a city map. After the break, you can go there and take it, yeah? And if you want, if you need, please uh, ask us we have a lot of undergraduate students <laughs> anxious to help you uh, uh, here and outside, and I think that they know better what you have, to, uh, what, uh, the, the better way to have fun in the city than I. Yeah. Okay. S have a nice meeting. Enjoy, and I hope to see you outside and in other moment. Thank you. With the word, Dr. Bruno Henrique Rocha Fernandes, Professor of the Graduate Program in Business and Dean of the Business School at PUC-PR. Hello, can you listen to me? Yes? Yes, thank you. So, first of all, thank you all for coming. Uh, in 2016, the Academy of Management Journal uh, published a call for paper called Understanding and Tackling Societal Grand Challenges Through the Management Research from George et al. And it was a call for research on, you know, sustainability, on how to, co to cope with this kind of um, you know, grand challenge of society that is quite summarized in the sustainable development goals from NATO. And uh, we can say that here at PUC PR and particularly at the business school and the Marist group as a whole, we are part of the Marist group, uh, we have answered to this call, not only through research, but also through actions. Uh, I would say that the idea of sustainability and ESG now it's uh, fashion the way we call it, it's quite a core in our strategy. Recently, I think that Paul is going to talk more about that, but uh, we have elected it as a strategic area from our group, the idea of sustainability, the idea of ESG. Therefore, the group as a whole, the university, and also the business school, we are doing a lot of work in order to, you know, to make it a real priority. Uh, for instance, I think that this symposium is quite an example on how we are, how we are, we are working, but I wouldn't say it's not just about doing research. We are actually doing very practical work. For instance, I think it's a quite a tradition at, 
our university, but at the business school as well, we have, for instance, adopted a community around here. Um, you know, poor people, uh, a kind of favela, and we are working together with them in order, for instance, to structure a cooperative there in order to generate wealth, in order to generate work for these people. And this kind of project, we are working together with our business undergraduate students, faculty members, doing consulting projects. So uh, it's an example. And of course, we are also using that kind of field in order to do uh, many and to do research on how can you make the difference impact the lives of people around us. And we also here at our research programs at the business school, we are doing a lot of work on sustainability on OESG. As I said, it's a priority that we have right now. Uh, we have uh, agreements with universities all over the world that are specific, who, which specific deal with questions on ESG or the way they say it, uh, ethics, responsibility, and sustainability ours. Uh, an example of that is that is one with Walks and University in India, which is a very interesting partner, and we are working together in many initiatives. So like, for instance, one that we call business tournament, through which we are going to find, you know, a community here, and they're going to find a community there, and they're going to have some kind of applied projects in order to make it better, to improve the lives of people here and there. So. Uh, this is just many examples of what we've been doing. So that's why this kind of event, this symposium, is, has such an importance for us. It's a quite an important event. We really appreciate the opportunity and even, I wouldn't say, even the privilege of hosting the kind, this kind of event here. So uh, you are very, very welcome. I hope you appreciate your staying here. We have a lot of discussion. We, have, we can improve our research. Uh, I would like also to say my thank to to all the supporters that we have here, the um, faculty members, the keynote speakers, uh, and we, you know, and first of all, you all that came here to take part, both online and here at the campus. So thank you so much, and I hope you appreciate your staying here in this symposium. <clears throat> With the word, Dr. Walter Liao, professor at the Hamburg University of Applied Sciences, Germany, professor at the Metrop Metropolitan University of Manchester, UK, head of the Research and Transfer Center Sustainable Development and Climate Change Management, chair of Scientific Committee of the First Latin American Symposium on Sustainability. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wonder if you can hear me? Yes, we can, perfectly. Wonderful. Good day, everyone. Uh, also, my warm welcome. As the chairman has mentioned, my name is Walter. I'm sending you my greetings uh, from Germany. It's a bit of a paradox because we have now a cold winter in Curitiba, and we are having a hot summer in Europe this year. We've been having record temperatures, very, very hot. So uh, this kind of uh, difference between having too hot and having cold, I think for working, the weather in Brazil now is perfect. Uh, you don't feel sorry for being inside working. Once again, a warm word of welcome from you. I'm very grateful to the team uh, at the Pontificia Catholic University um, of Curitiba for running this event, and especially to Professor Dr. Tato and of course, Fernanda and the team who has been very busy over the last few weeks, you know, a few months organizing this event, and uh, all for this moment of being together with you today. I deeply apologize for not being able to be with you uh, physically. You are aware we have now a serious conflict in Europe, the war with the Ukraine, and uh, I have made my mission to try to help colleagues working in universities to have to be, come to a safe place. You may imagine, dear colleagues, how awful it would be if your university is bombed, if your buildings are destroyed, you have no place to work, you have no place to host the students, and all of a sudden, all your work in academics collapse. 
That's exactly what's been happening now in the Ukraine with thousands of our fellow academics, you know, professors, you know, docents, but also many thousand students who are unable to be gathered in a seminar room, as we are doing today in Curitiba. They are unable to interact uh, because of the conflict. So I create a bridge. It's called the German Ukraine Science Bridge. And this bridge has been built to help colleagues working in academics to come to Western Europe. They can either come to Germany, but also to other countries. They can go to Denmark, Sweden, Finland, uh, all to the Baltic Republics. Many are going to Poland and give it their safe place. And this week we have a, a, a group of uh, 20 colleagues from the Ukraine, and we are looking um, after them uh, with their uh, families. So that's why I'm unable to be with you physically, but I'm still with you, with you now virtually and also in spirit. I think this meeting is quite important for many reasons. Dear colleagues, Latin America is the continent of the future. As you are aware, we have in Latin America a wonderful resource called human capital. Not only the young people now attending this meeting uh, in Curitiba, but also around Latin American countries, a huge amount of talent, lots of young people who are really in you know, the, the potential to work and to develop themselves, but did not do so due to various reasons. As you know, apart from the fact that Latin America is a great human potential, it is also a continent characterized by many social inequalities, by poverty, by you know, social injustices, and which makes development difficult. So Latin America, as the uh, continent of the future, badly needs sustainable development. Therefore, this symposium is quite timely because it allows us to discuss the problems we have in implementing sustainability in Latin American countries, but also allow to discuss the potentials. Therefore, we're very grateful to the speakers who are coming to share the experiences to this meeting. We're also grateful of you, also for the students coming to learn and to interact. And as usual, we will document the excellent work you are presenting in this meeting by means of the book which we traditionally produce uh, for the two hour events. So I'm very grateful to you that you are attending this meeting today. I think to be a well-invested time because it gives you the opportunity to get to know maybe new things you are not aware of or remind you about things you are aware of. You are able to access a wide range of expertise from different colleagues, which is impossible to do if you are you know, in the office. Therefore, coming from a meeting is such an important thing to do. And I also hope that you enjoy the opportunity to interact, to network and link up also with uh, other colleagues. Therefore, using you know, potential opportunities which came up uh, from this kind of uh, interaction. So once again, also from my side, a warm world of welcome. I wish you a successful interaction discussion in the next few days, and also looking forward to having the papers afterwards, which you process vis-a-vis uh, -a, -vis a publication in our book. So thank you for being here. With the word, Dr. Massimiliano Mazzanti, Università degli Studi di Ferrara. Hello, I hope you can hear me well. Uh, okay, um, thanks a lot for inviting me. I wish I could be there. Um, I'd like to share with you, if I may, some uh, two slides, just, just to present uh, uh, some food for thought. Um, please tell me if you are not able to see it. Okay. Okay, can you see the slides? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you very much. Again, um, very happy to be he here with you and you're welcome to visit Ferrara and we can organize events in the next future. So uh, j just to share with you some um, 
just this this type of uh, input for you and you mentioned students and, and uh, researchers. So this uh, report we published some years ago and here the framework is one where uh, where we wanted to emphasize the fact that uh, uh, sustainability uh, and the transitions are interlinked. So um, we have at the core, I mean, the environmental sustainability transition, but we have to take into account the interconnections, uh, uh, very important, the demographic transition with uh, differences across countries, uh, which has impacts on, on the labor force, for example, then these impacts on and interacts with the fiscal transition, which is also very important I mean, to sustain uh, investments, but also, for example, think about I mean, the sustainability of the welfare system as well. Technology, uh, which is part of the story. Uh, technology is a destroying factor, a creative factor. Um, and then finance, which is another another point. And then you may add other, other pillars here, but just to mention the fact that we have to consider different type of situations. To say also what, um, to say that um, I, I'm really uh, maybe obsessed with, with the fact that uh, in order to achieve sustainability, to, dec do, to uh, achieve a low carbon economy, a circular economy, green economy, we have to start and create a strong pillar on, 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 on based upon um, strong social, social um, glues and, and strong social investment. So we have to uh, make sure that uh, sustainability is desirable for society. Uh, and this is the rationale behind the just transition, I mean, having uh, ensuring that uh, um, equity and, and uh, uh, other social, social um, elements are um, within picture. So this is part of the rationale behind the European just transition, just transition um, framework. Uh, to say what, and I have a, a final slide uh, again as food for thought for um, you all. Uh, another point uh, is that um, the current uh, transition towards the green and circular economy uh, um, should be connected with different types of capitalism. Okay, so we don't have one capitalism, we have very different capitalism uh, with all the pros and cons, even within Europe, uh, Scandinavia, Germany, Italy, France, uh, um, the Anglo-Saxon ones. And uh, this is an important slide, I mean, the very famous slide about being the impact on, um, this is mean the, 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 the historical uh, issue about the share of, on capital and the share on labor, and you see that you have a decrease on, on, on the labor side, which is an issue, okay? It is an issue also in political terms uh, when we uh, discuss about uh, um, political parties, programs, and um, close to elections. You see here that, for example, France and the US, again, with all the pros and cons, I'm not saying that I'm in favor of, of one or the other. I have my, my, my preferences, but the point is that we have to find a coherence uh, uh, between the type of capitalism we have, uh, which may we may eventually change uh, a bit, and the type of transition um, in the green and circular economy transition we want to achieve. So uh, th this is this to say that we, we the sustainability transition is not neutral. It is uh, based upon uh, the past. It's, it's based upon the type of inst institutions we have, the type of culture, the type of uh, economic system we have. And the future so that's uh, so we can change um the system if you want we can adapt but we have to start with this with this picture so um that's what i uh, wanted to 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 share with you and um okay so uh enjoy the event and really really um uh i hope we could have uh, uh chances in the future to uh, meet us together Thanks again. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to thank Fernanda and Liraka for having me here, having all of us here. I'm not going to give a great speech. Just wanted to say that this is very important because we as Latin American need to start thinking what is our future going to be. We need to 
bring all of the US and European thoughts about Latin American and start to think by ourselves to build together a common future that can be socially acceptable for everybody, so there is no inequities anymore, and sustainable. So we, need, we do have a very green future, but we need to build it together. So us in Colombia, in the UBB, Universidad Pontificia Bolivariana, are working very hard to teach our students how to um, believe in a new future that stands for sustainability, social responsibility, and peace. So thank you all for being here. Thank you to the university for having us here and for having us the opportunity to talk and gather around to share different thoughts from multiple disciplines. I'm not um, business, I'm an engineer and also a literary scholar. So I think it's very good to have different views of the same problem. Thank you very much. With the word, uh, Dr. Carlos Lopez Preciado, Universidad de Colima, Mexico. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you, Professor. Okay, okay. thank you. Hi, everybody. Hi, good afternoon. See, over, over the last two years, we have seen organization from every sector and industry worldwide either begin or to accelerate our formation program designed to improve the way they work related to the environment and connect with their suppliers and employees. Latin America organizations are part of this enormous effort. Some of them decided to initiate the process driven by a deep belief in the contribution they could make in United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Others were motivated by the demands of their customers, employees, or value change, all of which clearly impact the organization's reputations. But the goal, in either case, is sustainability. We are very happy to express and send your greetings to all of you from the University of Colima, Mexico, the most important educational institution in the state of Colima, especially in areas such as medicine, political sciences, music and arts, economy, among others, no less important. For this first Latin America Symposium of Sustainability that will be presented in a multi and interdisciplinary way. We send our ratings to all of you from the presidents and directors of the university by the reason of which we are going to have in this important agenda where research, best practices, and sustainability projects will be discussed. We are sure this symposium that is focused on how society, companies, and organizations can operate in a responsibility, socially inclusive, and environmentally sustainable way, as well as promoting the exchange of information, ideas, and experiences of sustainable projects. Especially successful initiatives and good practices for Latin America. Therefore, from different areas of knowledge, it will be relevant to discuss methodological approaches and experiences from case studies and projects, especially in the concretion of the book, Sustainability Addresses Challenges and Creating Opportunities in Latin America, published by Springer, that since its beginning in 2015, has become the world's leading book series on sustainable development. Consequently, we are aware that we will remain entirely willing and motivated to continue in identifying and addressing challenges to be resolved from the perspective of sustainable development at a global level, with the strong intention to protect our world and improve our quality of life in the living beings on our wonderful planet. Thanks to all the people that have made possible this event, especially the organizers, for all the time and great effort dedicated to this symposium. 
as well as to the participating institutions for their magnificent organization and commitment, so that this event is attended with high quality at the global level. Thank you very much. With the word, uh, Mr. Rodolfo Zanin Feijó, Head of Foreign Affairs at City of Curitiba. Hello, everyone. I would like initially to thank uh, dear Bruno, Professor Tortato, and all the Pontifical Catholic University of Paraná for promoting this important event for the city of Curitiba. I come here today on behalf of the mayor, Mayor Rafael Greca, who couldn't be here today, but uh, he sent me here today just to greet you and to give you another warm welcome despite our uh, chilly weather. And um, this is a very important event for the city of Curitiba, and the municipality fully supports the promotion of it. Um, Curitiba is a city that has sustainability on its identity. Um, the city got well known uh, many decades ago world worldwide because we developed here the bus rapid transit system that got exported to more than 250 cities around the world. And since then, a lot of things have changed. We have here in Curitiba the Institute of Research in Urban Planning, um, which was founded by Jaime Renner, which is probably the most well-known um, Curitibano in the world. And I see today that his uh, legacy is being um, realized here through this event. Um, the city, um, as I said, supports this kind of event because we have in our strategic um, agenda um, the role of promoting sustainability not only for the city um, inhabitants, but for the entire Brazil. Curitiba is a city that is referenced in urban planning. Um, it was the first city in Brazil to do uh, selective um, solid waste management. Um, and now we are in the transition to um, a new economy. Um, and an economy that has inevitably to be based on sustainability. Um, we have been recently investing a lot and we have developed a um, climate agenda um, and our government plan is fully aligned with, the, with this purpose um, and we have been um, happy enough to share our experience in Brazil and I'm pretty sure that today's event will multiply the ideas that are being discussed here uh, and virtually as well to other cities in Brazil. Um, and I'm glad to see as well that we have a full participation of the international community on this event because this is part of the solution, um, global action. And Curitiba is fully engaged with this um, sort of initiative because, however, uh, global action uh, is taken, local action is needed as well. So this is very important and I'm glad to see here this today. Um, just to mention a few examples as well, we have implemented a full program on solar panels here in Curitiba recently. Um, just f four years ago, uh, we were happy enough to um, implement in our city hall the solar panels and our, um, and our main building now is fully supplied with energy from solar panels. And I always mention that this is a huge achievement for the city of Curitiba, but also shows how much we have to do yet, because in the White House, it was in the late 70s with the Jimmy Carter administration that the first solar panels were installed. So we have a huge gap to fulfill still, um, but I think we're on the right path. Um, and apart from the academic community, I can see that is also um, an engagement from the private sector and is, this is pivotal for the change that we want to implement in Curitiba. Um, and it's important also to take this valuable information to decision makers, 
to CEOs and company president, presidents so they can see the benefit of implementing a fully sustainable agenda. Um, and I'm glad to see that these private sector leaders are already implementing this agenda um, because obviously they have the civic duty to do so, um, but it's a survival matter for the companies, for the populations, and for the entire world. So I'm pretty happy to see this event happening in Curitiba. You have the full support. For those who are here in Curitiba, I hope you enjoy it. You'll be able to see some of our experiences uh, to visit, site visits that uh, Professor Totato has been um, working closely with our team. Um, and I really hope that you take this uh, seed that has been planted here today in Curitiba and take around the world for the benefit of humankind. Thank you very much. Have a great event. And with the word, Dr. Paula Cristina Trevilato, representing Pontifícia Universidade Católica do Paraná. Thank you, Caio. Thank you, Professor Tortato, Professor Bruno. Welcome, everyone. The ECO 92 or Rio 92 conference was the first United, Na uh, United Nations conference on environment and development held in Rio de Janeiro in 1992. This conference had important developments from a scientific, diplomatic, political, and environmental point of view, in addition to giving uh, space to debates and contributions to the environmentally sustainable development model. 30 years later, PUC-PR meets with partner institutions in Latin America to organize the first Latin American Symposium on Sustainability together with the Hamburg University of Applied Sciences, Germany, Universita Pontificia Bolivariana, Colombia, Universita degli Studi di, di Ferrara, Italy, and Universita de Colima, Mexico, um, focusing on how society, businesses, and organizations can operate in a responsible, socially inclusive, and environmentally sustainable way, in a great opportunity to bring their agenda to the global discussion, to foster the exchange of information, ideas, and experience, experiences, especially successful initiatives and good practice across the Latin America, addressing challenges and creating opportunities in Latin America. In this meanwhile, in 1915, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, were established by the United Nations and make up a global agenda for the construction and implementation of public policies that aim to guide humanity until 2030, the Agenda for Sustainable Development. In this context, PUC Paraná established six strategic areas. One, smart cities. Two, clean energy. Three, information and communication technologies. Four, health and biotechnology. Five, human rights. And recently, six, Environmental, Social, and Corporate Governance, ESNG. Considering the environmental pillar, PUC-PR intends to intensify actions to leverage SDGs 7, Affordable and Clean Energy, 11, Sustainable Cities and Communities, and 13, Climate Action. Examples, our first published sustainable report, and the PUC-PR Climate Labs by André Turbay and partners from Colombia, Mexico, Spain, Italy, and France, supported by Erasmus Foundation. Finally, Pope Francis calls us to reflect on the care of the common home, which urgently needs to change something at the collective level in order to seek a new universal solidarity. Because pollution, food shortage, shortages, climate change, the issue of water, and the laws of biodiversity are putting the sustainability of creation at risk. I wish you a successful conference and a great time here at PUC Paraná. We invite now 
Professor Dr. Walter Liao Filho to the opening presentation. Professor Dr. Walter Liao Filho has a first class degree in biology and a doctorate in environmental science having also completed a postdoctorate program on environmental communication. He also has a higher doctorate in environmental information, a doctor of philosophy in sustainable development, and holds the titles of doctor of letters, doctor of literature, and doctor of education, commensurate with his scientific performance and outputs, translated by nearly 400 pub publications among books, book chapters, and scientific papers. Professor Liao Filu is the director of the Research and, Trans and Transfer Center Sustainability and Climate Change Management at the Hamburg University of Applied Sciences and a professor of Environment and Technology at Man Manchester Metropolitan University, being a member of the team at the School of Science and the Environment. He's also a member of the project's complaints mechanism of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. In 2009, he created the International Climate Change Information Program, which is the world's leading program on climate change education information and communication, running many climate and sustainability events around the world. He teaches on environmental information, education, communication, and management issues at various European universities. He is the editor of the International Journal of Innovation and Sustainable Development and Discover Sustainability, and founding director of the International Journal of Sustainability in Higher Education, the International Journal of Environment and Sustainable Development, and the International Journal of Climate Change Strategies and Management. He is also a member of the editorial board of the journals Sustainable Design, Sustainable Development and World Ecology, International Journal of Global and Environmental Issues, Biomedical and Environmental Sciences, and Environmental Awareness. Professor Liao is also editor of the book series Climate Change Management and World Sustainability Series. Professor Walter. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Once again, a good day, everyone. It's a very comprehensive introduction, so th thank you for that. And uh, I would like to spend uh, the next few minutes with you uh, talking about the connection between university and, and climate change. So I will try to share with you my screen. It worked before. I hope it also will work now. Um, let me see what it does. Looking good. Perfect. So, dear colleagues, I will spend some time talking to you about two very important matters closer to my heart, which is basically um, sustainability and climate change and how they interact in a university context. Therefore, the need for integrated approaches. I don't think I'll spend much time describing me because the moderator has done a great job, well done. Uh, so you are bet you are very good, you're very well informed. But just so fast to say that uh, I wear these two hats. I am indeed a professor at the Hamburg University of Applied Sciences. We have the Average and Transfer Center, which focuses on sustainability and climate change management. That's 15 years now. We're gonna celebrate in this uh, autumn, our 15th anniversary. And I'm also the chair, I have a chair uh, at the Manchester Metropolitan University on environment and uh, uh, technology. Uh, in this introduction, I want to draw your attention to a publication we issued last year. You can see here the so-called GUC report, University Facing Climate Change and Sustainability. And this report is open access, it's freely available. So if you are interested, I would warmly invite you to read this report. It's produced by the Global University Council. Again, it's freely available. So I'll be talking about university sustainability, remind us about this topic and outline some fields of action. I will then zoom in into climate change in universities, also outlining uh, some uh, fields of actions. I'll then make some conclusions and finish by issuing an invitation to, to all of you. Uh, dear colleagues, it is uh, known, well known, that uh, the university sector can be compared to big companies. You know, universities consume much resources, you know, lots of energy, uh, lots of water. They produce uh, a lot of waste. So it'd be, it'd be wonderful if universities could work towards making themselves sustainable. 
So not only about teaching sustainability, not only doing research about it, but also practicing what we preach. Meaning that uh, if we talk about sustainability, we have to make our work uh, sustainable. And we're able to do that because we have the knowledge is necessary for putting uh, sustainability principles into practice. Um, the discussion is not new. I remember uh, one of my first publications on the topic is called, as you can see from this slide, Implementing Sustainable Event at University Level. It was produced in cooperation with the Council of European Record, uh, Rectors. This book was back to 1996. So you can also see how old I am and how old this whole debate is, 1996. So it's really has been a, a long time discussion is taking place. It has also been evolved in different countries. This slide is in German, but it says uh, environmental protection and sustainability at universities. That's a, a, a book I produced you know, for the German audiences as a result of a meeting. And this book was published in 1998. So as you can see, again, the discussion is not really new, but progress has been quite slow, quite frustrating. I uh, have worked in this area for so many years and see how slow uh, progress has been. Um, more recently, there have been a, a significant engagement in terms of uh, moving the agenda, you know, the Global Agenda 2030. This book may be known to some of you, because it's a book we produced after our symposium in Curitiba, uh, before Corona, about uh, Meet Diego's Agenda 2030, uh, which was also mentioned in the opening of this event. Uh, and of course, we are moving forward now about you know, integrating uh, social sustainability, social responsibility, sustainable development, the so-called ESG. And we are now moving towards in this direction. So much is happening, much progress is taking place. Uh, more recently, uh, some of you may be aware, or some of you indeed were, were authors of the Encyclopedia of the SDG. That's a, quite a large project. Uh, the Encyclopedia involves uh, 17 volumes, uh, each volume uh, for each SDG. So 17 volumes in total, and each volume for about 100 chapters. So we had this uh, encyclopedia has uh, a little bit over uh, 1,700 chapters and over 2,500 authors work together in gathering information, gathering knowledge about sustainability and how that relates uh, to the SDGs. So you can see the evolution on the topic. Uh, more recently, produced a handbook uh, to support teaching and learning sustainability. As you can see here, Fernanda has been uh, quite an active uh, colleague in this uh, effort. So thank you, Fernanda, for being part of our, of our effort. We try to demonstrate you know, practical ways to, to foster teaching research on sustainable development. So, and uh, drawing from the whole body of information from these works and publications, we have identified, you know, some areas uh, where we can implement sustainability, and I'll, I'll dwell on them for some minutes because they are quite important to us. So, you know, from the point of view of administration and management, in the research, uh, the operations, education, and also in relation to uh, community engagement. If you look, if you look for the administration, uh, it is also an area of central concern. I mean, the university rector or the vice rector, you know, the, the, let's say the, the university governance, uh, those in place, they are really, really in a very good position to develop a concept or strategies to implement sustainability within the organization. Uh, dear colleagues, I frequently notice that there are many efforts happening at universities, uh, but they are really a result of the effort of some colleagues. There are some champions uh, within universities who work in this area. It makes a lot of sense to have the management involved, have the administration involved, so that the work become an institutional one, not only a personal one, and also make sure that the work is being done is constantly uh, monitored, the progress can be measured, and things can be improved. So involve, uh, involvement of my administration is one of the uh, key items in moving sustainability forward within a given university. The second area of action is this part of research. I think I met closer to all our hearts in this meeting. We're all involved in research. 
we can do so uh, in teams uh, where we can not only foster an understanding or foster a better understanding about sustainability, but also seek solutions for the many problems we are facing right now. And uh, as you are aware, there are really many result needs to be met. I think if I ask the question, you know, how many research needs are there, we'd spend a lot of time discussing there are many research needs which have to be addressed. So I always say that sustainability is a blessing for research because it offers scope for all sorts of studies on a variety of issues. So research, a second action area. A further action area is about the operations. Once again, how can we make the work we do as a university more sustainable? And uh, I will go into details uh, shortly, but, you know, try to make the operation sustainable means, you know, how can you use energy sources or foster uh, alternative ones? We are a little bit proud that our university in Hamburg, the University of Applied Science in Hamburg, uh, our energy is 100% for renewable sources. There are also other universities elsewhere using these systems, a growing trend, but we need more. Ideally, all universities will at some point in time be uh, using renewable energy and become carbon friendly, if not carbon neutral. So we can do a lot of that within the operations. We have a program in Hamburg called 5050. That's a deal we have with the government, which says that if we are saving energy, let's say we have an energy bill from last year, and you have the energy bill from this year, and if you save the energy, uh, energy bill, the energy costs are reduced because we are more energy efficient and because you are using more renewable energy, then we can keep half of the savings for reinvestment. It's a good deal, this 50-50. Uh, uh, further areas of engagement is, of course, the education. As you know, we can, and we can include, we can um, inculcate, we can force sustainability in a variety of ways in the curriculum. It can be a course or courses. It can be as modules. It can be as part of modules. It also can be as units. So there's a very flexible way of including sustainability in the curriculum, accommodating education needs. There is one old excuse for not including sustainability in education, namely, oh, we have no time, or our time it tables are already too full. Nope, that's not an excuse. You can flexibly include sustainability in education in a variety of ways. And there are many interesting methods we can use it for that. Uh, for example, one can use a, the so-called project-based learning uh, for, you know, talk about sustainability uh, at a particular course. You can also use problem learning. You can also use project learning. There are different modalities of methods you can use to make it easier to incorporate sustainability in education, in a curriculum, no matter at which discipline you are involved with. Um, and then, of course, the issue of rankings. Um, so what I've been mentioned to you about areas of actions are some criteria now being currently used in respect of ranking. There is a growing effort, a growing movement towards having rankings or metrics uh, for universities in respect of sustainability. And there are, of course, to some well-known rankings in the degree March or they are very common in the UK, the people in planet, or the, I think, a large um, metric system use, the green metrics from the World University, World University ranking. So these metrics have one thing in common. They are trying to provide indicators by which the university work can be measured against the criteria I just mentioned to you. There are many more, but some of them are, you know, research, campus operation, you know, teaching and um, governance. So these this are, you know, increasing trend. And uh, the uh, ranking uh, uh, people in planet is very common for the UK. They have the so-called People in Planet University League. And an interesting feature of this uh, ranking is that most UK universities are involved in it. We sometimes observed 
the fact that uh, whenever there are rankings, some universities take part, some do not. But the people in Planet Rank has been so well established in the UK that most leading universities are, are using it. And um, our uh, university, uh, in Manchester Metropolitan University, has been ranked number one uh, last year, 2021. You know, the rank is giving every year. So we've been uh, among the top three uh, for the last five years. And last year, 2021, with the current year, we've been, uh, let's say, top of the ranking. So that's a thing for you to take a look at the rankings. You can see more or less, you know, Manchester Method, the first one, then comes King's College, then comes Nottingham. So there are 19 universities in the ranking, but of course there are many more. But there's something very positive about this ranking, namely that universities are constantly being encouraged to engage on sustainability, the so-called peer pressure. Because if there are universities working this area and engaging, the other ones too feel motivated to be part of this effort. So no matter if you want is for or against this ranking, there is a positive feature coming from them. Universities are encouraged to engage. And of course, within the framework of sustainability, climate change, reducing climate emissions uh, is part of the process. People in planet ranking. Dear colleagues, I am not sure whether we can work uh, like this being online, but I'd like to ask you to the group a question. Uh, dear colleagues, which is the world's most sustainable university? Could perhaps you or you, some of you in the audience make a guess? In your opinion, this colleague, which is the world's most sustainable university according to the rankings? Can anybody please tell me? Feel free to speculate. I would guess maybe somewhere okay, in Okay, so it does not seem to be working so well. So let me release you from your speculations. People usually say, oh, this is Cambridge. Oh, this is Harvard. This is MIT. No, according to the, uh, to the large university ranking, the world's most sustainable university is the University of Wageningen in Holland. So they've been now for many years leading the, the, uh, the table. They were chosen uh, by the fourth time in 2019. And then last year they were chosen again, you know, for the fifth time. They've been leaking the, uh, leading the ranking, you know, of the green metric ranking, because they've been doing exactly what we discussed earlier on. They have a very good governance system in place for sustainability within the university as a whole. They have a special program for teaching, a special program for research, a special program for you know, going to the curriculum and also for the operations. So that's why they have been having this title. And I suspect they will, they will be actively continue to, uh, you know, to, uh, to uh, um, defend this title in the coming years. But it's a very healthy competition to have those rankings. People are encouraged to act. Um, and of course, the reason uh, why I just mentioned uh, the reasons, uh, because they are engaged, they also have a long term commitment, they've been able to motivate their staff and students. Uh, I'm very sorry to say that in some contexts, the university's work are led by some members of staff, a few people, he is quite a wide effort. And they also have this special feature of also um, actively engaging the students. In this combination of factors, plus the readiness to substantially invest in sustainability, you know, make them uh, to be in a position to be leading the ranking. Okay, and uh, there are two pieces of information I'd like to share with you. Uh, the GOC report and a report recently published by the Association of European Universities. And the, G G the, G the GOC report, I mentioned in the introduction to my presentation, uh, Universe Facing Climate Change Sustainability, that's a report which analyzes the situation in respect of uh, the emphasis given to sustainability and climate change in a sample of universities uh, in Brazil, uh, in Germany, in India, Japan, South Africa, UK, and the US. And the report, once again, uh, is completely available online and has been uh, co written uh, with uh, the colleague Tristan McCowan, myself, and Professor Brandley, uh, who is from Passo Fundo in Brazil. 
And uh, this other university took part in this study in São Paulo University, with the South Santa Catarina, you know, FU Berlin, Eberswalde, in India, Pondicherry, India Institute of Technology, uh, in Japan, Tohoku University, and Rutzmeckan University, South Africa, Stellenbosch, University of South Africa, which is the one of, well, the largest university in Africa, uh, with, uh, you know, over 200,000 students. In the UK, Nottingham trained in Edinburgh in the US, Arizona State, and Middlebrook College. And in this report, we have identified the fact that uh, the work of universities, which is on the left side of this slide, can be greatly supported if they are able to you know, make the links with the actors, with not only uh, the, you know, the former students, the graduates, but also organizations, you know, NGOs and communities. And then they, if they move on to the next step, you know, making bridges to society, taking into account economical issues, political issues, the cultural sphere, and ultimately involve the ecosphere, trying to address things linked with climate change, uh, biodiversity conservation, and environmental quality, then they can really make a contribution uh, towards society. So universities themselves should not and cannot work alone. If they want to succeed, as far as implementation sustainability is concerned, they have to you know, build a bridge with the actors, with society, and also not lose the view that ecosphere is also quite important. It's one of the main results of the report and how these elements uh, mutually interact. Um, we recently produced this piece uh, last month where we try to explore the links between universal sustainable development in cities and try to make the approach more symbiotic. We have one uh, problem in the sense that uh, many works done at universities are at universities and not much of it is actually goes outside it. So in this particular paper, we are pledging that we produce, we, we develop more symbiotic approaches where we try to make the links between university and development and the cities they are based at. That's why I'm very proud today to see that the city of Curitiba is at this meeting. You know, thank you for being here. I represent the, the, the mayor to show that you know, PP, uh, the Pontificia Catholic University uh, is really linking up with the city of Curitiba. That's a good way, a good example with more should follow. And there are some five key lessons from the work we've done in this report. I think the first one is about the issue of leadership. We need a strong leadership within organizations to support the efforts in the long term. We also need a sound framework of governance with really, you know, sustainability being embedded in universities' DNA, not only by having it done on an ad hoc uh, let's say, based, but also by having it in the program with uh, uh, a, a kind of strategy or action plan. Of course, funds is a central matter not to be ignored. So the efforts are really long-term and not short-lived. Uh, the issue of networking, uh, I cannot overemphasize how important networking is for us to realize a sustainability effort. And to a final lesson from the report is that we should praise the uh, institutional diversity within organization. You know, people from different departments, different disciplines. I know it's hard to work together with different uh, areas of knowledge, but it's a blessing because the work becomes much more robust. So some key lessons from our report. In the report, Greening uh, European Higher Education, uh, which was recently published by the um, uh, European Universal Association investigated uh, 372 universities in Europe. And I think this sentence, this sentence here epitomizes uh, the essence of the report. Let's read it together. Many higher education institutions are addressing greening and more broadly sustainability through a wide range of policies and activities. That's a fact. The interesting, uh, let's say, part is the next sentence. While some higher education institutions only offer ad hoc activities, I think it's the majority of them, others, the minority, support them through strategies and coordinated process. So I think the message from the report is that we should be moving away from only have ad hoc initiatives going towards a more coordinated approach 
where we have you know, strategies, which have action plans over many years, which can be undertaken and can be monitored. That can allow us to move ahead in a significant way and avoid the problems we've been having in the past. What about universal and climate change? So we spent some time, you know, recapping, reminding us about universal sustainability. What about climate change? Well, dear colleagues, uh, I've been working uh, in this, uh, let's say, uh, in this uh, intersection, universal and climate, for the last 15 years, and I'm very worried about it. Basically, if we take a look at this slide, that's a slide from the latest report of the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. You may remember from the introduction, uh, I've been working with the IPCC uh, for the last uh, 12 years, and I was a lead author in the current report, the assessment report number six. As I was, I was working with group number two, which look at climate change adaptation. Now, this slide tells us a story, namely, the global surface temperature is increasing, and there are different scenarios which are quite modest. For example, the scenario um, SSP1, 1.9, which shows that we may have an increase of 1.5 degrees to the end of the century. And then we have the scenario SSP 2.6, we nearly, we nearly, we'll nearly reach two degrees. And then comes the more serious scenarios, such as the SSP 2, that says we're gonna may we may reach you know 3.8 degrees by the end of the century. The SSP 3 says we may reach four degrees, and the SSP 5 says we may reach five degrees by the end of the century. Now, no matter which scenario you are looking at, there are very worrying trends because the even modest increase in temperatures or the expected increases are likely to lead to severe changes on the global environment. For example, we're already experiencing very hot summers uh, over the past years. We experienced changes in the raining seasons. And we're also seeing a noticeable decrease in the ice sheets. You know, the North Pole and the Solar Pole, North Pole and the uh, South Pole and Antarctica and Arctic, the ice is melting quite quickly. And whereas in previous times, the ice would melt, melt in the winter, sorry, melt in the summer and rebuild in the, in the, in the winter, it no longer takes place. So the amount of ice melting is far higher, the amount of ice being rebuilt, which may lead to sea level rise. So, and then we have, as far as climate change is concerned, uh, this what I call the paradox. Uh, dear colleagues, let's take a look at this picture. Let's try to identify uh, the kind of message which this picture is trying to convey. So if you compare the upper figure with the lower one, you can see some differences. So if I could, I would like to ask you to explain what is the difference. It seems to be technically difficult, so I'll try to explain to you. Uh, the first graphic, the upper graphic, shows or visually or graphically describes the countries as far as their production of carbon dioxide is concerned. So you can see, for example, that North America, um, Europe, especially North in Europe, produce lots and lots of carbon dioxide. You can also see that uh, not so much in Latin America um, and also very little in Africa. That's the message from the upper picture. Now, what the lower picture is trying to tell you, and that's the paradox, is that even though the counts on the upper picture which are you know, big, become, big, become smaller, uh, Africa becomes bigger. Because Africa and some parts of Latin America, uh, the graphic is not very precise, uh, they are the ones suffering the most from climate change. So the upper picture shows the countries producing CO2 emissions, carbon dioxide, and the lower show the countries suffering from climate change. And as you can see that Africa is one of the countries suffering most from climate change. So the so-called paradox, rich countries produce the problem, but the poor countries suffer the most. 
So we've been trying to address this problem by had some uh, also some publications back to 2010. We produced this book about universal and climate change, uh, which trying to draw attention about the need for engaging universities more uh, on climate change. Uh, I've not stopped. We've been also working further in this area, trying to focus on universal initiatives in climate mitigation adaptation. We have a full volume on the Encyclopedia for Climate Action, and uh, more recently, a, a, a book on research on climate change at universities. Based the idea is that university should be involved on sustainability, but we work on sustainability should also get involved on climate change because it's a very important item of the formula. There can be no sustainable development unless we address climate change. And we cannot address climate change if we don't, if we don't make the world more sustainable. So you can see how close uh, these topics are. So, universities are also major consumers of energy. They are major emitters of carbon dioxide. They really, really produce a huge amount of carbon dioxide, particularly because some buildings or many buildings are old. You know, they're not really very energy efficient. And uh, we've done also some work in this area, and we produced a paper last, last year. We tried to find, you know, how to handle um, climate change in the education at universities and draw attention to a number of, of uh, approaches, a number of methods we can use to try to include climate change in university education programs. Not only about climate science, but also in other education programs. And uh, I mentioned the issue of buildings. Most buildings are really old, over uh, nearly uh, over eight percent of them. They're not really they are not really energy efficient. But universities can can change it by making the buildings uh, more carbon friendly by redesigning them. It can be used in natural cooling systems, also natural heating systems. We can also use solar energy, you know, for uh, making the building more, let's say, um, uh, um, energy friendly by capturing sun, uh, sunlight and using it. And in the future, we are talking about so-called zero buildings. It's a very common trend in the UK, where many universities are now very much involved in making the buildings you know, carbon neutral, or even a zero building, where the building uses the energy which is produced by itself. That's also a growing trend. Um, renewable energy is also an area universities would engage more. We have now the technology, and I'm thinking a country like Brazil, which is a country blessed by the sun, why not? Why aren't we using more, you know, uh, renewable energy in Brazil to uh, uh, to power the work of universities, you know, by uh, powering lecture halls or cafeterias? Uh, in our university, we have a campus called Energy Campus, and we have, you know, two wind turbines. We provide energy. Uh, to the university. So apart from the fact the university we have is renewable, so we are really carbon neutral as far as energy is concerned, we also produce energy as well in the building and along the way train lots of students. A further area university can engage um, in, in terms of uh, um, uh, work with energy is about energy efficiency. In this paper, also published a couple of years ago, we tried to identify the extent to which universities are promoting energy efficiency and renewable energy. And I'm very sorry to tell you that the amount of effort is not really very big. There's still much room for improvement as far as becoming more energy efficient and as far as using renewable energy universities is concerned. So there's much work to be done in this area. A further area is about using water. Universities should be more engaged in promoting water conservation by having water recycling steam, uh, scheme, but also you know, installing you know, very simple facilities for access to drinking water uh, and uh, discourage the use of water bottles. So at the university, also in Manchester, we offer to the student free and easy access to water and reduce the need for bottled water you know, for plastic waste. A further area is about food consumption. That's, I think, area where we can do more, you know, by encouraging the production of local regional products. And uh, there are many universities engaged in these areas. You know, they have their own, let's say, gardening on campus where they are growing vegetables, they are having growing flowers. 
And uh, this kind of uh, campus, uh, let's say, gardening is not only helpful in educating the students, uh, but also in their producing, you know, regional food, uh, which is also a very nice thing. And we all have a common goal. I think all of you also attended this meeting, which is to reduce the amount of food waste. Uh, dear colleagues, I'm also uh, concerned about the amount of food waste produced at universities every day. And we did this study um, a couple of years ago, where we tried to identify you know, how much food waste has been produced by universities. And I'm very sorry to say the amount is not justifiable. We are spending you know, several tons of uh, food that have been wasted every day universe around the world because we don't really have efficient way to calculating how much food will be produced and consumed by the students and a lot of it is, is thrown away that's also an area we can do more and reduce the carbon impact of, uh, of food production and reducing food waste green transport also another area we can do more especially if we have a large campus where we have long distances so we can use electric scooters, we can use shared bicycles to reduce carbon emissions. A lot of work has been done in these areas in Germany, you know, in Holland. Um, we also have a growing trend where we have electric cars, uh, which are now growing down in price. And there are also uh, more and more uh, charging stations. Uh, Germany is, is leading this area and there's a lot of effort also in Holland. Uh, we're using more electric cars in campuses. And we can certainly do more in terms of climate change in the curriculum. Uh, no matter if a module is technical or non-technical, non there are many ways of putting climate change as part of the dialogue. And the students can take part in these modules from across different subjects, and they can also undertake projects with their communities and you know, trying to also help the environment in this way reducing the reduction of food waste, uh, you know, a more environmentally friendly transport systems, you know, use of renewable energy, the variety of topics we can use to, to include in climate change the curriculum, uh, even though we don't have to focus on technical climate issues. What about the students then? Coming to an end. The students, they are the most important stakeholder in the university. That's why we are there. They are our most important asset. So I'm pledging uh, in the morning more for an even greater engagement of students, sustainability, and in climate change efforts. And this, there are some ways to do that, uh, you know, by involving them in the working groups, like you have, you know, at the Pontificia Catholic University. Uh, uh, in, in Curitiba, uh, giving them space for their ideas by supporting their efforts. For example, uh, creating green offices. Uh, this photograph is from the green office at the University of Louvain in Belgium. Uh, our university also has a green office and then, you know, um, encourage them to act and also listen to the students. We can do a lot by listening to the students about what they need, about what they want, because they are our main reasons of existence. Therefore, we should listen more to them and engage them more, especially the ideas. Um, in, in, in general, dear colleagues, the way we're working home is that uh, we have a, a strategy for sustainability where climate change is part of the formula. You know, we're involving our internal stakeholders at the university, you know, our faculty in other faculties. We are also, you know, taking into account a variety of aspects. Certainly COVID-19 made us think more about the way we operate. Therefore, we are more sustainable. We certainly give a priority to the SDGs. So if you come here to see us, we're going to see SDGs everywhere. And we're very concerned about it, but of course also linked with climate change. And then we also engage very much with our external actors to make sure the work we do has societal impact. So coming to an end, I hope to have shown that uh, university engagement is not a luxury. Uh, in celebrating climate change, it is, it is urgently needed. We cannot overlook how important these two topics are. There are many efforts taking place. And I think the rankings, which I've shown today, show some examples of this effort being implemented. Uh, there are no recipes. It would be a, to be a mistake to think oh, there's a recipe we can follow. Nope, there is no recipe. It, each organization decide what works for them, what should be their focus. 
We need more integrated efforts among staff and students. And if we work together, many nice things can happen. We can raise the awareness among staff and students. We also save money quite often. We show we care about these issues. And there are some non-cash advantage, for example, improving our image and also support the research and the teaching we do you know, towards work in a, in a better world. That's why I think, dear colleagues, we should do more in respect of linking up sustainability with climate change is a win-win situation in two major issues in today's world. Um, I promise to, uh, or this is by the way, uh, a paper we also recently produced about partnerships uh, in the SDGs. Uh, this is a paper is also open access. It's still available to you just to show how much we can achieve by having a you know, partnership in this key area. So I promise to finish the presentation by with an invitation to you. There are lots of invitations. Uh, the first one is that you may draw in the East Group mailing list. Uh, I think it was mentioned in the presentation. We run this program. It's called the Inter-University Development Research Program. It's called East Group. East Group has a little bit over 170 members. That's the world's largest network of universities to work on sustainability. Therefore, we have a mailing list. You can see here the address. We can make a screenshot uh, and access this mailing list. There are uh, over 600 members from, from around the world. It has information about forthcoming events, forthcoming project possibilities, publication, etc. Um, a second invitation for the doctoral students uh, attending this meeting is a network we produce, we, we created this year, is a special network for doctoral students who work on sustainability. So this network is really to try to link up doctoral students. There are lots of them working around the world. Uh, we have about a little bit over 120 doctoral students as part of this network. It's very simple to join, you know, it, it has no costs. Are also a good way to engage if you're doing research on celebrity at doctoral level. Um, and also we are starting this year a new initiative. It's called University and Climate Change, which does what we discussed today, you know, encouraging universities to be more involved uh, with climate change. And on the right hand side of the uh, of the slide, you can see some of the events coming up. You can see the event in Curitiba right now. But it's also a symposium going offices in December. This will be online. And there are two physical events taking place. Uh, the Soviet Science Symposium uh, held in Spain and the a symposium will be reporting, uh, which is being held in Italy uh, next February. So uh, you're welcome to be part of this effort. This is what I mentioned to you earlier on. This initiative universal climate change is also free of charge. We have about 150 member universities, part of this network, which is about encouraging you know, universities to engage uh, in climate change. Also, uh, participation here is also uh, free of any charges. So I'll stop here uh, by thanking you very much for listening to me. I think we have a few minutes left for any questions. Once again, congratulations, uh, 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 Professor Tortato. Congratulations, Fernanda, for this very nice event. And uh, you know, thank you for listening to me. I will stop the presentation now. Thank you so much. Professor Walter, thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, one question from an audience member. No? Not a question? OK, do we have Fernanda? OK, please, come on. Have the mic there. Hi, can you hear me, Professor Walter? I can. Yes. OK, so um, first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to think about what is going on on universities and sustainability. Um, I would like to know, in your opinion, which are the uh, biggest challenges we in Latin America have to work with sustainability in universities. I know that you have a lot of contacts in Asia, Europe, uh, North America, and Latin America as well. But in your feeling, which is uh, which are the biggest challenges we have? Thank you, Fernanda. A very uh, important question. Uh, I think that uh, the list is long. <laughs> but I think that uh, a challenge that I often see 
is the fact that the uh, initiatives are not part of a systematic effort. If you look around and check out how many universities have a sustainability action plan or a systematic program, that is not really very long. Uh, most of the work is done by a few champions. We know some of them. Uh, so we need more support, you know, from the administrations, you know, we need a greater governance to allow things to move forward. Sometimes we miss opportunities. The lack of governance means that there are sometimes opportunities coming which are simply missed because there's no, no infrastructure in, pl in place for carrying on um, activities. Um, we recently applied for a large grant for the German Academic Service for Cooperation. It's actually an SDGs project, and we want to have partnership with university, which have a strategy. Well, it's very difficult to find. So therefore, I think one big issue is uh, to have the effort systematically organized by a systematic program. You can call it action plan, you can call it strategy or something, to give them a sense of direction. That helps a lot. Thank you very much, Professor Walter. Do we have any questions from the audience online uh, or otherwise? Yes, we do have a follow-up question. Victoria. Um, hi, I'm João Pedro. I'm a student, student here in uh, Pontificia Universidade Católica do Paraná. And sorry for the, my ignorance in the, the matter. It's not my area of expertise, uh, climate change. Not yet, not yet, not, right. not yet. <laughs> right. Um, so if I comment anything inadequate, I'm sorry. This, I'm just curious okay. about it. Sure. Uh, for the context of the question, uh, given the recent scenario concerning the war of Ukraine and Russia, where the exportation of gas to Europe has been obviously shut it off. This implied on the usage of coal as fuel for the heat systems during winter. Uh, the question is, is the climate change in the climate change community developing contingency, is the climate change community developing contingency plans for the extreme situations uh, given the scenario of minimizing damage to the environment as the example uh, thank you thank you for raising this very important uh, issue uh, yes you are right uh, the current crisis mean that means that yet again uh, the plans for climate change have to have a lower priority it was the case two years ago with the corona pandemic, where climate change disappeared from the agenda. The focus was corona, you know, COVID-19 only. Now the war is taking place. And the conflict means that, uh, indeed, a number of European countries, Germany, of course, included, have now to use more fossil fuels to make up for the lack of gas, which uh, Russia is no longer exporting you know, as a tool for putting pressure on, on Western Europe. So yes, that we are seeing a very sad trend in that uh, there will be an increase in CO2 emissions. Uh, of course, we still have the summertime, but the winter is coming certainly, and we're gonna see increase in emissions as a result of the conflict. So once again, um, climate change has been suffering now this time due to the conflict. There are, of course, efforts now. I think uh, the one, if there is anything positive with the reason to this conflict, is that people are more aware about renewable energy, about becoming you know, energy self sufficient. It is driving now, uh, um, uh, uh, make, uh, uh, leading to a drive in more um, initiatives to use more renewable energy. That's the only good thing from this conflict. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Walter, for your speech. Uh, due to time constraints, we have more questions from the audience. However, due to time constraints, we thank you very much for you being here and uh, sharing this uh, with us, Professor Walter. Thank you very much. Sure. We now invite Professor Dr. Rodrigo Lozano for his keynote speech. Professor Rodrigo is a full professor of organizational sustainability at the University of Gavel in Sweden. He is specialty chief editor of Frontiers in Organizations for Sustainability. He is a visiting professor at Central University of Technology in Bloemfontein, South Africa. 
He was editor-in-chief for the Journal of Cleaner Production, previously assistant professor at the Copernicus Institute of Sustainable Development in the Utrecht University, the Netherlands, and program leader of the BA Environment and Business at the Sustainability Research Institute, University of Leeds in UK. For over 20 years, Rodrigo has been working towards sustainability in NGOs, universities, and corporations. His projects have ranged from sustainability competences and pedagogical approaches, chemical leasing, indoor air quality and energy efficiency, to sustainability assessment and reporting, and to organizational change management. He has developed assessment tools such as the Graphical Assessment of Sustainability Performance, the GRASP, the Sustainability Tool for Assessing Universities Curricula Holistically, the STAUNCH, which was shortlisted for the Times Higher Education Awards in 2008, and the Graphical Assessment for Sustainability Universities, the GAZU. Rodrigo, Ro Rodrigo holds a BSc in Chemical Engineering, graduate with honors, from Monterey Technological in Mexico a Master's of Science in Environmental Management and Policy from the International Institute for Industrial Environmental Economies at Lund University in Sweden, and a PhD on Organizational Change Management for Corporate Sustainability at Cardiff University in Cardiff, UK. Rodrigo is also the Managing Director of Organizational Sustainability Limited. The host of this speech is Professor Ubirate Tortatu, Professor Tortato has a BA and a master's degree in business at Universidade Federal do Paraná and a PhD on production engineering at Universidade de São Paulo. He's working with the thematic of sustainability in the, in the last 15 years for academic and non-academic organizations. He was the editor-in-chief of Brazilian journal Strategy, Hebrai, and now he's associated editor in Frontiers in Organizations for Sustainability and Discover Sustainability. His field of research is focused on circular economy and ESG. Professor Rodrigo, Professor Tortato. I feel like a rabbit here with those lights. Is everybody kind of awake? Is everybody freezing? If you're freezing, hug your neighbor. But don't give him or her COVID, okay? Whenever you're ready, I'm ready. I'm ready, you ready? Yeah, yes. I'm the start. Well, I'm going to take you through a different path and it might become obvious towards the end of the presentation. Uh, Professor Tortato asked me to keep you here until 9 p.m. if that's okay or is it 9 a.m. tomorrow morning? Yeah. We'll stay here until I finish talking which is usually about five minutes from now. Okay so we've been talking about sustainability and I'm not going to go through again climate change and water and get you depressed. Well just a little bit I shall get you a bit depressed. Uh, during the last four decades or so, we've been having a lot of different efforts to try to address sustainability. Professor Walter Leal has been talking about what uh, universities have been doing, but we cannot also forget what uh, was done in Rio and what companies have been doing in the last so and so years. And what we're trying to do is we're not trying to only focus on climate change, not only on energy. We want to look at the whole picture. We want to look at everything, and that becomes very complicated. Because if you study business, you only want to look at business. If you study engineering, you only want to look at engineering. But in sustainability, we must look at everything. So if you make a business decision, that's going to have impacts in the environment, on social issues, and all of those things. So we've been trying to address those things through what we call a holistic perspective. So looking at the whole, not just the different parts, but at different parts and how they connect themselves. And that's what brings me to organizations. I've been working in sustainability, I think I said 20 years, maybe 200 years or some, something like that. I completely forgot. And one of my passion is looking at organizations. I started with my master's looking at universities, my PhD in companies, and then I came across what we call public sector organizations, and then I came across football clubs, 
One of our latest papers is on sustainability in football clubs. I totally hate football. Don't ask me why I got involved in that. But hopefully it will be published soon. And then we got uh, also in hybrid organizations. And then you're like, what the heck is all these things? So what is an organization? It's an integral part of societies. So you look at everywhere and you'll find an organization. It can be a formal organization like a university. It can be an informal organization like a group of friends, like the three of you over there. It's an informal organization. Or the four of you over here, it's an informal organization. You don't have an organization here. You're just over there and over there. There are subsystems of a larger environment. So you'll find organizations within a larger environment. You look at the city, the city itself is not an organization, but the city is full of different organizations, like a football club, uh, like the municipality, like the university, or different universities. So you'll have all of those. And each organization has boundaries. So you look inside the university, that's one part, but you also look at the outside, and all those parts keep on interacting. And they are very complex organizations. The three of you are not that complex as the four of you. And if you bring more people, it becomes more and more and more complex. And you have a lot of uh, feedback loops. But each organization has to accomplish an objective. So if you look at, for example, the objective of the university is to make money? No. It's to try to do research and education. And depending on the type of university, you might be doing more education and maybe a bit more research. If you look at a church, call it whatever church, what is the purpose of a church? is spiritual well-being. You look at a hospital, it's physical well-being, right? So each organization has an objective, and they have to fulfill it. A company, just make money. That's what we call create value, and we're not talking about monetary value, we're talking value in general. And they have differentiated functions. So you have, for example, the CEO, you have management, you have marketing, you have operations. Uh, when Professor Walter Lial was talking about a university, you have an education, research, operations, blah, blah, blah. And those are affected by what's happening outside. So all of universities, all the organizations in the world were affected the last two and a half years by COVID. Instead of meeting here face to face, we had to meet online. It was fun for the first year, not so fun for the second year, and now nobody wants to meet online. What's, what we call organizations are semi-open. So any organization will have things that come into the organization. Energy, water, raw materials, people also come into an organization. But we also have things that leave the organization. For example, product, CO2. People should also leave the organization from time to time, right? Should... Although in the case of some Nordic universities like mine, some people don't leave, and then you... Yeah, I'm not going to go there. And there are things that stay in the system. So all this infrastructure, the computers should usually stay in the system, although you need to lock them in some certain countries. I'm not going to say which countries, but yeah. And the seats that you're sitting in, they usually stay here, right? They don't go to parties in the summer. We have, as I mentioned before, what we call civil society organizations. That includes education, depending on how you see it. We have NGOs, religious organizations, institutional organizations. We have corporations from small and medium-sized enterprises, large, large companies, um, inter multinational enterprises, transnational companies. We have the public sector organizations going from the local, regional, federal, um, national. We have education um, organizations. Again, they're a bit different than civil society, depending on how you classify them. Uh, we have the basic higher education, lifelong learning, and then we have the hybrid organizations, which are a combination of, for example, a university that is a for-profit um, organization. We also have uh, public-private partnerships. We have government-owned companies, and we have a lot of those different things that kind of get together. So the last, I would say, um, uh, 40 years or so, organizations have been uh, um, targets of research and also work for sustainability. They've been driving sustainability in many ways. You have companies that have been driving sustainability quite a lot. You have universities that have been driving sustainability quite a lot. And the other organizations are kind of just sleeping in the laurels and not just doing much, especially civil society organizations. And that's because 
the whole nature is very fluid, it's very organic, and it's very difficult to really engage with them. But we have a, pay, uh, a project about cooperatives soon, hopefully. And there's been quite a lot of interest in what we call organizational sustainability. If you look at research on corporate social responsibility, and very uh, um, prevalent in business schools, for example, research on CSR goes back to 1929, 1928, 1929, not 50s, as a lot of people claim, but 1929, late of the 90s, there was a lot of money in the world, and then you had a big crisis and a war, and kind of looks at right now, right? Just the 20s, but from the previous century. But lately, we're in the last 10 years or so, is what we call organizational sustainability or sustainable organizations. So we, not, we look not only at a company, not only at the universities or universities, but we look at all organizations. And we try to find out which are the things that are common in all organizations. So not, oh, my company is different than your university. Well, yes, there are some differences, but also some similarities. And that's your organization, right? It looks very nice, a bit square. Yeah? We have what we call your internal and your external environment. We have a lot of inputs. And then you have in the white, in case you cannot read it, you have material resources and energy that come in that have an economic value, a cost, and that have an environmental value that we tend to really neglect. And we also have human resources that come into the organization. Fine. Then we have things that go out the organization. We have your products and services, so you transform your materials and energy into your products and services that have an economic value. Hopefully you increase, right? And then the, the government tells you you have to pay a value-added tax on top of that. By the way, that's another project I have on how to add those things. You have an environmental value. Hopefully you increased it and not reduced it. And then you have your human resources that have left the company after their, their shift. We have your resources, your infrastructure, you have your change processes in all the different parts of the organization, including, for example, operations and production, research and development, service provision, assessment and reporting, governments, man management, and organizational systems. We have a clicker that is not working. We have waste. You always generate waste. That, that's the natural laws. You always generate waste. You have, you have to deal with that. You have recovery. And talking about circular economy, that's part of recovery. And then you have to see whether you can close the loops or not, not only environmental, but also money-wise. You have your supply chain, upstream and downstream. And then you have your different stakeholders, internal stakeholders, interconnecting stakeholders, and external stakeholders, including companies, government, civil society organizations, NGOs, blah, 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 a lot of them. And then you have one of the most important dimensions in sustainability that people tend to forget, and it was mentioned previously. It's the past, the present, and the future, and the rate of change in those things. So if you look at a company, um, IT company, the rate of change is very, very, very quick. But if you look at, for example, the one of the very first corporations, the Catholic Church, the rate of change in the Catholic Church compared to an IT company, it's very slow. The rate of change of university is, I would say, medium slow. Okay, So you have to take into consideration that rate of change. But you also have to take into consideration where you're coming from, where you are, and where you want to be. It's not the same being at the university in Curitiba or in Sao Paulo or in Sweden. You have or we have different histories and we have to consider our history to address sustainability. You cannot address sustainability in Colombia in the same way as, as in Mexico or Brazil or Sweden or Spain. So we need to look back, look at the present and look at the future. We have to have that purpose fulfillment of that organization. And finally, we have to contribute to sustainability. One of the things that I've seen in a lot of organizations is people saying, we have to integrate the SDGs. Look at the SDGs, 17 SDGs, 169 goals. Look at any organization and ask yourself, can I integrate those 17 goals into my organization? The simple answer is, no, you cannot. They were designed by government for government, not for organizations, by organizations. So we can contribute directly or indirectly to the SDGs, but we cannot integrate them. So coming back to the question 
of this title. Why do we need life cycle assessment? That's usually what we tend to focus on. We tend to focus on a, on a typical small part of the life cycle. That's your product, product user consumption, and that's about it. We want, what we want to do is we want to look, look, focus at the entire life cycle stages from extraction to disposal, passing from materials manufacturer, product manufacturer, and we have to use all the R's in uh, circular economy. We have to also have to put economic value to all of those things. So you can see this in a bit more circular way, where you have your natural resources. Let me see if this works. Yeah, it kind of works. Natural resources, extraction of raw materials, design, packaging, use, disposal, incineration, recovery, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's what we want to to do. There's been a lot of different sustainability tools, initiatives, and approaches that have been developed. From the 1970s to now, we have a long list of those ones, including uh, corporate social responsibility, corporate sustainability, life cycle assessment, design, eco design. Uh, environmental management systems, uh, we've had a natural step, we have factor four, we have factor 10, blah, 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 and depending on where you are. They have evolved from purely looking at the disposal, so what we call end of pipe, clean your mess, to don't create the mess and looking at the entire system, so what we call a whole systems perspective. We have the most important ones, the most cited ones are 24. And we can divide them into operations, management and strategy, supply chains, and assessment and reporting. You have a long list there. And I'm going to be focusing now in life cycle assessment, but there's a book that I recently published this year. I can send you the details, and there's, they're described over there. And life cycle assessment is a technique for assessing environmental aspects on compiling an inventory of re relevant inputs and outputs, evaluating the potential impacts, and interpreting those results. Sounds simple, right? It was developed by engineers for engineers, and it's fairly simple. No, it's not simple. It's very expensive, and it's very complex, and you have to, to get some software to do it. But it gives you a lot of information. So you can say, well, this product is more environmentally friendly than that product. Cool. You use it from what we call cradle to grave. So you go back to where that product was originated. So if you take, a, for example, this clicker, I can see at least two different types of plastic, different types of paint. It probably has some batteries. And you start thinking, where did the plastic come from? It comes from oil. Yeah, but what was the process to get it there? What was the impact of transforming the oil into that, that particular plastic? OK, now uh, the clicker is not working anymore. Do I take it for repair? Not usually, you just throw it away. Well, you throw it away, it ends up in a landfill, or do you recycle it? How is, what is the environmental impact of that? We use it to, one, compare products. So is this clicker better than the other clicker, or not? Or we can also use it for, to detect what we call hot spots. As that's not a, a movie or anything like that. It's to, to know in which part of the life cycle you're going to have the major environmental impact. So for example, Washing machine. You use them here in Brazil, right? Yes. Where is the most environmental impact of a washing machine? Is it during extraction, production, use, or disposal? Use by about 20 times more than anything else. So the more you use your washing machine, the more you're going to be damaging the environment. Ah, OK. So if you compare. Again, going to the kitchen, washing the, the plates, the, the dishes by hand, or washing it in a dishwasher, which one is more energy efficient? Which one is more water efficient? Dishwasher. dishwasher is more water efficient. Have you considered the entire life cycle assessment? Probably not. So on every use, the dishwasher is more efficient. But the dishwasher is full of steel, different parts. Well, how do you? Produce that steel, how much water do you need to produce that steel? So that's when you start thinking, oh, is this more efficient than the other one? And it did usually not. Okay, the dishwasher is very convenient, especially if you have a big Brazilian party, yeah, a barbecue. And that life cycle assessment allows you to have those quantifiable information and say, hey, you know, this is better than that. It's based on 
what we call an objective scientific method, or at least as what we want to call objective and scientific. It's based on the laws of thermodynamics, and the mass, mass balance and thermodynamics, and you have to look at the entire life cycle. Okay? And the laws, uh, natural laws, just for those who are engineers, raise your hands. Okay? So for all of those, you, you can sleep for the next two slides because I'm going to really bore you to death. Uh, we have what we call the law of conservation of mass. And that means that mass is not created nor destroyed. It is only transformed. So whatever we do in the, in the earth is going to stay in the earth, period. So we take oil, we take coal, we burn it. It's going to transform into something else. Usually CO2 and water. They are mass, yeah, it's the same amount of mass. It's a different type of mass. And then we have the law of conservation of energy. And that means that the same as with the conservation of mass, low energy is not created, not destroyed. It is only transformed. And then we have, of course, the laws of thermodynamics. And uh, me, as a chemical engineer, I have to really you know, touch here with you, these things. The first law of thermodynamics says the internal energy of an isolated system is constant. In short, energy can be transformed. The second law of thermodynamics is that heat cannot spontaneously flow from a colder location to a hotter location. Eh? It means that heat goes from the hot source to the cold source. And the last one, it pretty much says that energy degrades. So any, every time you use energy to do something else, it degrades. So first of all, remember mass, you can transform it into something else, but it might degrade, and the energy, the same thing. This is the scientific evolution of the tools, initiatives, and approaches uh, that uh, some colleagues and I did. We published it, yeah, this year. You see LCA is here. It's the oldest one of the tools, initiatives, and approaches, in short, TS, or CHIES, if you speak Portuguese. Yeah. It's the oldest one, and it's the one that has been published the most. So it is very well known, LCAs, all over the scientific community. Uh, if you look, for example, uh, co corporate sustainability, CSR is up here. Sustainability reporting is up here, but look at the numbers here. You have 3,000, and then you have 1,000, so it goes down. When you do research in organizations on the 24 tools, initiatives, and approaches, life cycle assessment is number nine in usage. You have the triple bottom line, the natural step, and uh, no, sorry, this is not right. No, I should have put it on, on, on a ranking way. But like, this is on uh, alphabetic order. So in alphabetic order, is nine from the left, uh, from the right to the left. I should have got the, the good graph. We also have another concept for those of you who are not engineers and who hate numbers we have what we call life cycle management that's more for business schools okay so like oh no don't don't give me that number it's a business management approach what tells you is look at the life cycle but you don't need to quantify it you just need to consider the life cycle assessment the life cycle of the product or the service that you're doing so go back and ask where is this coming from you don't need to quantify it, but you need to think about where is it coming from. And you can use it in both large and small firms. You can use it to target, organize, analyze, and manage product-related information so that you can con have continuous improvement throughout the entire product life cycle. On life cycle management, it is about making life cycle thinking and product sustainability operational for businesses and continuous improvement. And that you want to reduce your environmental footprint and minimize your environmental impact. How do you integrate those things? You have to integrate it in all of your rut uh, routine business processes as a business strategy. And you have to gradually build capacity for action and broaden the boundaries that concern that thing. So it has to be aligned with all the different options, with all the different strategies and efforts that you have. We also have what we call life cycle thinking. Now I'm confusing you a lot. Not? Not yet. Okay. Life cycle thinking is essential for sustainability. Life cycle assessment, is, you have to quantify. The other one is more of a business strategy. This is something that once you leave those doors, you can never forget about this. You have to always have life cycle thinking. Where do things come from? How do we use them? Where do they end up? 
So sustainability cannot be sustainability without life cycle thinking. It's very important. It goes beyond the traditional focus of on pro uh, production sites and manufacturing processes, and you have to consider all environmental impacts from the beginning to the end. You want to reduce a product's resource use and emissions to the environment as well as improve its socioeconomic performance throughout the entire life cycle. This may facilitate links between economic, social, and environmental dimensions within an organization and throughout its entire value chain. So, just putting it in a bit of a picture. You have life cycle assessment, which is more narrow, and it's a tool. You have life cycle management, that is a process, business tool. And you have life cycle thinking, that is a concept. And this is the one that if you take anything from my presentation, is life cycle thinking. So don't leave those doors without putting life cycle thinking there on, the, on your internal CPU. So just going back to this one, you have this as an organization, right? Yeah, clear? All happy? And then you have this as a life cycle. But one of the things that have happened in a lot of life cycle is that we're focusing on a product or two products. What about the organizations that are part of those ones? Even in sustainable supply chains, we're looking at the supply chain. We're not looking at the organizations on those different parts. So what we must do is we need to add all of those different nodes and all of those different parts and look at the life cycle, not only of the product, but also of the organizations that produce and modify and alter and manufacture those products. Now comes the difficult questions. How can you contribute to life cycle importance for sustainable organizations? Well, I was introduced as the editor uh, of the section on sustainable organizations, and uh, Professor Tortato is also part of that, and I have a few other people who are helping me with that. And what we want to do is we want to look at organizations, formal, informal organizations. We look at holistically. We look at, for example, manufacturing. We look at education. We look at uh, product life cycle management. What was the other one that you uh, published, uh, the research topic last year? We look at everything that has to do with organizations, formal and informal organizations, the ports, institutions, and everything like that. And we have a research topic, what we call research topic in Frontiers, it's called a special volume, on product life cycle management. And for that, what we want to do is we want to look at the product and how you create, manage, and share engineering data of products are called life cycle phases and thereby enhancing productivity and efficiency. And we want to transform our societies according to this. We have a, a variety of different technologies for that. And we have, for example, the Internet of Things, cloud computing, data analytics, and those feed into life cycle management and life cycle, life cycle product management. And blah, 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 blah. And we have a number of different questions. So what are the states of the art on PLM in science and practice? How does PLM contribute to improve environmental performance of product life cycle, how new technologies can be used for that, who in different organizations contribute to better performing, and how do customers and suppliers affect the adoption of PLM practices. You might recognize some of the people over there, right? You know this fella? He's sitting over there, and you know that fella, he's sitting over here, and we, ha we have also a series. A series, are you here? Uh, a series is not here? No. Uh, he'll be here tomorrow. Hopefully. And uh, Tomohiko is in Lean Shopping University, and David uh, Meyer is in the EPA in the US. Okay. Muito obrigado. Thank you. And as I said, I mentioned the book. The book is called Towa Sustainable Organizations. I don't know who came out with the title. You know, people who do those type of things. And on that book, you can look at it on the on over there. I'm not going to do a lot of uh, publishing or, or advertising of my book here, but I liked it. Yes. Why not? Why not? Okay, Rodrigo. Thank you. I think that you you uh, well 
you offer us a, a, a very inter interesting topic. Yes, I, I think that we have to reflect. And well, we are, we have a special edition in Frontier Sustainable Organizations open, and you can contribute. But now we have time for your questions. Yeah. Any question? Yes, we have one. Please. First of all, thank you very much for your presentation. It was uh, really, really nice, really interesting. Can you uh, present yourself, please? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm Eduardo Benassai from University of Ferrara. I'm a PhD fellow. I work on the same things, more or less. I work on LCA as well. And uh, I'm working on plant-based products in this period. So I was wondering, it's more a comment and a question at the same time. I don't know. Um, because I came to uh, things that were a bit out of the boundaries of uh, a product or a process. Let's say, for example, I came to intercrop analysis of some plants or plant products. So um, perhaps it's a wide question. Do you think that we can um, sharply define the boundaries of the life cycle or perhaps sometimes, or perhaps now it is widening a bit in the, I don't know if I was clear. Yeah, you're very clear. Traditionally, you have to define those boundaries, but you have to consider that life cycle assessment has, I mean, it has evolved from the traditional perspective. And now we are in sustainability research, we're looking not so much into one part, but we're also looking into the connections. So how can you look at the life cycle of this part without looking into the connection of the other parts? I think I have. Is that a little bit better? <laughs> yes. Uh, so you, you have to look at those interconnections. And one of the things that I've seen in sustainability and I've tried to do is we have to just stop looking at economic or environmental or social. We have to look at economic and environmental and social. And even in environmental, you have to look at the different parts. So you have to look at energy and water, energy and water and biodiversity. So it's the same thing as, you, as you're mentioning. I cannot look on the, at this plant. I have to look at this plant and that plant. So if you take into consideration one of Brazil's uh, favorite crops, coffee, Colombia too, you cannot grow coffee without bananas because you need the bananas to give the, 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 um, the shade to the coffee to, get, to have the best coffee. So you need to look at both of those plants. So it's uh, what you're saying in intercrop. That's what I would really like to see in sustainability research, not focusing so much into that, but opening more and looking at those connections. Because sometimes the connections have become much more important than just the little notes, the little elements. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for your question. Okay, we have more time. Any other question? Was I that boring? <laughs> no. Or uh, are, are you hungry? Maybe, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yep. Uh, so, hi, uh, my name is Pedro. I am st I'm a student in management. And my question is, you said that uh, life cycle life is life cycle assessment. Asset, assessment. You said that it was very important to us go out of here, you know, keep that in, keep that with us. Uh, my question is, if <laughs> no, sorry, there is a way to make it more simple because I think there is the one of the big reasons that sustainability is not very widespread in the in the white pub, in the general public is because the way it's complicated is most have access to the origins of a lot of products or they don't really care where the products goes ends up with you think there's a way to make it more simple or that's i mean if you do if you take a normal lca it's expensive it's it's complex and it, it takes a long time to do it i've done one and i never want to do one another ever again in my life but that's when you go back to lcm and lct and that allows you to become to make things that are very complex in, in a more simplistic way. So that's why I say start thinking about where do things come from? Where do things end? If you go to the supermarket and you buy a chicken, where does the chicken come from? Where does it end? How do you cook it? When you cook it, do you use, uh, for example, natural gas to cook it? Do you use electricity? And those type of questions are the ones that you have to start asking in order to make that complexity less complex, but you start expanding your mind. Mm -hmm. So 
Now go back to the chicken. I use uh, natural gas. Where does the natural gas come from? Does it come from Colombia? Does it come from Argentina? Does it come from Brazil? Uh, okay, how do we extract that? And those, just keep asking those questions. Where does it come from? Where does it end? Once I burn the natural gas, becomes CO2 on water, where does it go? Mm -hmm. right. Thank you. I have a question. Okay, go ahead. Uh, okay, so my name is Vittoria. I'm an international management undergraduate, so I'm sorry if my question is kind of dumb. But I come from an international relations background. And I see that countries are very complex organizations, as well as companies are too. So my question is, what do you think the relation between companies as organizations and countries as organizations are contributing to st sustainability and what are the challenges that they face nowadays? I wouldn't see a country as an organization. A country is more of a kind of a state, and then we can have that. We can ask the political scientists to, to do that. But I see as a country more as a boundaries. So if you want to put it like that, you have boundaries, same as in the states or, or cities. And within that, you have different organizations that interact. So you look um, at any country. Okay, you have the military. And within the military, you have different organizations. You have the police, you have different organizations. You have the civil servants, and then you have the um, hospitals, depending on whether the, pri the hospital is private or public or private public. So that's how I see them. It's very important that organizations, as with LCA, know that they have to interact, as the same with um, uh, academic disciplines. So you, 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 read, you heard my CV. My CV is all over the place, if you want to put it like that. Why? Because I'm very curious on looking at it from different perspectives and looking at how things interconnect. So how does a company connect to a city, connect to university? And we hear, we had the case that the university here is being connected to the city in order to become much more sustainability oriented. So we have to get out of our preconceived frames and look out to other organizations of the same type of other types or to other um, disciplines to other countries and learn from them. And that's very important. I've lived in I don't know how many countries and I've learned good things and bad things in, in many different countries. And then when we, when we say here in Latin America, our, publics, our, our problems are so unique, you go to Poland, and they say, our public, the problems are so unique. You go to South Africa, our problems are so unique. And then you're like, I just visited those different areas and you're talking about exactly the same problem and each of you is telling me that your problem is so unique. Then it's not that unique. Uh, we were discussing yesterday or today in the morning about South Africa. South Africa is a beautiful country. Brazil is a beautiful country. You have, we have problems of poverty, uh, crime. In South Africa, the problems are, the range of problems are like that. And the, the extent of that is because of the history. In Brazil, the problems compared to South Africa, they seem to be a bit less. But when compared to Sweden, Sweden, the problems are slightly narrower. But if you go to Sweden, then you can try to learn from that. I'm not saying import it to Brazil or to South Africa, but learn from that, learn from their mistakes, and then see that Brazil and South Africa don't develop in the same way that Sweden or most of Europe did, that you have a huge boom of industrialization, now we have a huge problem of waste. Huge problem of waste. Here, let's going back to the chicken. You buy one, one whole chicken, you use the entire chicken. In South Africa, nothing is, is left. In Europe, very few people buy an entire chicken. You buy chicken breast, chicken thighs. What happens to the wings? What happens to the neck? What happens to the bones? What happens to all of those things? They end up usually in um, the waste. So those type of things that we, we need to learn. Bananas. You buy bananas here wrapped in plastic? No, they're already wrapped. I mean, in some countries in Europe, they wrap them in plastic. And you're like, why do you wrap something that is already wrapped? And it's a perfect wrap. Any other questions? Or you want to clap to, to warm your hands? Uh, hi, my name is Ana Maria Osorio. I am Colombian, but I'm studying here. I'm a PhD candidate in uh, urban management. My question is uh, if there is a different 
of the approach of sustainability in public and private organizations? Yes and no. As I was mentioning before, that's why organizational sustainability comes in. Uh, so you have differences and you have things that are very similar. One of our latest papers is on the impact of organizations to SDGs. And hopefully it will be published this year, maybe not. We find out that organizations of all types have more or less the same impact to all the SDGs except three, education, and the other two, I don't remember which ones are those. But when you look at that, at the data, you're like, we're having the same things. Yeah, I mean, a university is different than a company. We have a, a university that focus most, more on education, and companies don't, right? Public sector organizations, they don't focus so much on education. So the impact is going to be different. But also in that paper, we're looking at the interaction between the SDGs and those things. So that's why I answer yes and no. There are things that are very similar, and things that are not. In public sector organizations, you tend to have much more bureaucracy, whereas companies tend to be tend to be more lean in that way. But you also have companies that are owned by the government that act like public sector organization, and then you have companies that are private and still have a huge bureaucracy. So yes and no. But that's something you can research. OK, thank you. I think after hearing, um, listening to, to Professor Walter's presentation and your presentation, I, I have this question for universities. If there is a difference between public and private universities and as corporations. Uh, yes and no. I mean, some universities that are public uh, have more bureaucracy, some that are private have more bureaucracy. You have to consider that the ones that are private, not only do they have the goal to educate and do research, but they also have to survive because they have to get their own money. Whereas the public universities, they're kind of, kind of assured to have the, the, the resources and the funding from the government. But it really depends on the university. And again, we have to look at the history of the university, the present and the future, and how they're going to be moving. You have universities that are very niche, very small, very large, online universities, Okay, just to say that I'm a nice guy, we have time for just one more question. A volunteer? If you don't ask that question, we stay here until five o'clock and you won't get any cocktails, no food. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think that the, they, they want to go to the, 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 the lunch, mm. not lunch, the cocktail, yeah? No, no, until they ask a question. Yes. <laughs> so think, think. It's mandatory. Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. Now. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. Sorry for the cold weather. It's not in my hands. But. <laughs> okay, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lozano. <laughs> thank you very much. Caio, the word is easy for you now. We thank Professor Dr. Rodrigo Lozano for his speech with uh, Professor Birata Tortatu. And uh, just before we move to the break, uh, we will invite uh, Dr. Fernanda Frankenberger for some advice. Hi, everyone. Actually, we have only two small advices. Um, first of all, uh, we will uh, uh, take a picture here in some minutes after we finish the session. Before we go to the uh, cocktail, then everyone please come here. And the second one is about the publication and, and the book we are producing uh, from this event. Uh, I will contact some of you during the event to check if all documentation is correct and so on. 
Uh, and, uh, but we will have time tomorrow, so enjoy the event, enjoy the sessions you will have tomorrow, and enjoy as well the um, workshop you will have tomorrow afternoon with Professor um, Rodrigo Lozano as well. So thank you very much on behalf of PUC Paraná. Uh, we are very glad you are here, and we are having wonderful days ahead. Thank you. <laughs>